Amen. Amen. So we find ourselves in Romans 15, uh, picking up really what Paul had started in chapter 14, dealing with some of these issues in the church. These are not issues of sin, but what we call the gray matters, that there's things, traditions, and practices that, you know, they're not really uh, based in specific biblical truth. There's kind of a freedom there. There's a grace there. You know, what kind of clothes we wear to church? You know, do we wear a tie and a suit, or is it okay to wear flip-flops and a Hawaiian shirt? You know, what about uh, the kind of food we eat? Is it more spiritual to eat, you know, certain kind of foods other than, that rather than other kinds of foods? And, you know, we talked about everything from tattoos to movies and all of these different things that God doesn't say, you know, thus saith the Lord, you can't watch an R-rated movie. You know, thus saith the Lord, you know, this is how much alcohol you can drink safely and not be drunk. Because we know if a person said, well, I have the grace of God to be, you know, to, to drink lots of alcohol to the point of drunkenness. We would say, well, no, you're misunderstanding the grace of God. The grace of God is not for your drunkenness. That's sin. That's clear. That's not a debatable issue. But there are other things that are just not so clear. For them, Jew and Gentile, Jew and everybody else, there were issues of calendar. What day is the right day to go to church? I mean, is Saturday better than Sunday? Is Sunday better than Monday? And some believed that one day was better than another. The Jews believed that Saturday, the Sabbath, that was the day that they should worship the Lord. But the pagans, the, the Gentiles, didn't have such a belief. So they had arguments and divisions over these things. About what day was right to worship the Lord. And they had arguments and divisions over food and how food was to be prepared. The Jews had a long history of regulations regarding their food. The Gentiles didn't have those regulations. And now God brings these two incredibly and vastly different people together into one family. And now Paul is giving them very practical advice on how to survive and thrive as a community when we come from so many different practical backgrounds, even religious backgrounds. And do you think that the truths still apply to us today? I mean, don't these things still affect us today? We have people in this church that come from all over in terms of background, some from more legalistic, more restriction and regulation-based backgrounds, and some are coming right out of drug abuse and alcoholism and have no church background. And now we all come together and worship the Lord together, and things that uh, are matters of opinion and tradition can tend to divide God's people, and so Paul is giving them this intensely practical information to help bring them together, and, and it's still necessary today. Mark Twain is famously quoted as having said, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me, it's the parts that I do understand. Have you heard that quote before? Well, Romans 15 fits into that category. It's not the parts of the Bible that we don't understand that trouble us. It's the part we do understand. And when we get to Romans 15, we're still continuing the discussion about what Paul called the weak Christians in the church and the strong Christians in the church. The strong being those that recognize that you're not saved by tradition and regulation and those kind of things. You're not saved by those religious practices that you're saved by grace. So if you want to eat, you know, you feel like eating a certain kind of food is right or wrong, that's fine. But you're not saved by those things. So there are certain people that, that have a little more, they take a little more liberty with their Christian life. They, they dress a, a certain way and they don't feel bound by certain restrictions. But then there were others that, again, maybe you grew up in a very restrictive re religious uh, atmosphere where you just, like, the thought of not wearing a suit to church is, like, unbelievable to you. Like, you can't even imagine that. So... You know, uh, Paul is dealing with these, these two groups of people, and he calls one stronger and the other weaker in the faith in terms of their understanding of applied grace into our lives. And he's still carrying through that argument, that discussion, when we get to chapter 15, verse 1. So he's kind of summing up what he's, he said and bringing it to a conclusion. He says, we then who are strong, he includes himself in that, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let me just give you a simple outline for, for the message today as we head from verse 1 down to verse 13. He lays out a principle 
It includes verse 2. Let me just read verse 2, and then I'll give you the principle. He says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. So the principle in terms of how to have a healthy, vibrant community of faith is the principle, don't be selfish. That's the principle. Isn't that easy? See, it's the easy things that we struggle with. Don't be selfish. That's the principle. The proof he's going to give us, Jesus wasn't selfish. And then there's a prayer. He prays that they wouldn't be selfish. Pretty simple, isn't it? So he starts out with a principle, don't be selfish. Then he gives the proof, the biblical proof for that principle is Jesus wasn't selfish. And we call ourselves Christians. Jesus wasn't selfish. And then he just simply applies it through prayer, recognizes that the way to to have these things be effective in our church is to pray about them, to pray to those ends that we would not be selfish. When's the last time you prayed that prayer? Lord, make me unselfish. Make me selfless. I want to be more selfless. I want to be more concerned with what others need rather than myself. When's the last time you prayed that prayer? So he says, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. The word to bear with means to carry or to put on your, put, to take and put it on yourself. You pick up a backpack and you put it on, you've borne a burden, you've taken a burden on yourself. And so when we talk about this relationship between the strong and the weak, he said the strong, he speaks to the strong because most people are going to identify, well, yeah, I'm the strong one in this, certainly that's me. Very few people would identify themselves as the one who is weak. In any community, whether it's on the the sports field or in the classroom, not everybody is going to be at the same place skill-wise, are they? In a classroom, you got kids that are, you know, maybe it's a math class, and this kid's like a math genius. We had a group in our in our high school called the Mathletes. Do they still have that? The Mathletes. I always thought that was pretty cool. Mathletes. So you got the kids that are just just doing great in math, and other kids that struggle with math, they're more, more artistic or whatever. So not everybody's the same in the same place, and even on the ball field, whether it's football or baseball or soccer or whatever, you've got kids that are really skilled and kids that are less skilled. And in church, you have people that have been walking with the Lord a lot longer. They've just been, they, they know the word, it's been part of their lives for a long time. Then you've got people that are just new to the faith. Just, just getting into this. And so we're all over the board. And the responsibility, Paul says, we would say, well, the weak people should just get with it. Weak people just ought to pull themselves up by the bootstraps and saddle up and get with the program. See, the strong like to put the responsibility on the weak to get where they are. Well, they should just get where we are. But Paul says, no, 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 I'm going to flip it around. I'm going to give you who are strong, you in your strength, have the responsibility when you see someone who is weaker to care for them, to bear their burden. Instead of going, well, they should just bear up their burden. Paul says, if you're so strong, why don't you use your, use your strength to lift their burden? How about that? Especially when it comes to our toxic, American, individualistic, self-centered culture. Remember Paul started this in Romans 12 by saying, don't be conformed to the image of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so this is part of that. Paul is trying to get their minds wrapped around the fact that when it comes to church, you can't bring in that worldly toxic culture and expect it to work here in the church. How many of you have ever been to a, met a selfish person in church? <laughs> Yeah, we, we know this exists, and so it's something some people are not there yet. We're all, you know, we all struggle. This is the big deal. You know, this is the, we struggle with the kingdom of self versus the kingdom of God. And so Paul says, look, you who are strong, the word ought means to have an obligation to. You have an obligation to bear with the scruples, or that's an interesting word, the, the weaknesses really is what it says, of the weak and not as opposed to the opposite of pleasing ourselves. Because that's what we typically want to do. We want to typically get what we want. That's our toxic culture, right? We have this, we're, we're living in a time where we have so many things available to us. Too many things, maybe we could argue. Too many TV stations. Too many opportunities. Try in a school setting 
Try having kids do a group project and get a group grade. How does that work out? Oh, it doesn't work out in American culture because the one kid who excels, he doesn't want to be graded based on how the group did. He wants to be graded based on his own success and failure, my own ambition. I, need, I got a college to get to. I mean, I got to get good grades in fifth grade because I'm going to Harvard because I'm going to be a rocket scientist and I'm going to make millions of dollars. I mean, it's like, where are you going with this? And so we want to be graded as individuals. Paul says you can succeed in, as an individual, but ultimately you fail if you succeed alone in the church community. Now, the world will tell you opposite. Look out for number one. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. The strong survive. Let the weak perish. Let them figure it out for themselves. In the church, we have a responsibility for discipleship. If you got some strength, the question is, how are you using your strength not to please yourself, to get your needs and desires met. But how are you using your strength to build up somebody else? Did you see that's what he says in verse 2? Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. The word to edify means to build up or to promote progress. In whose life are you promoting progress? Because no matter how weak you think you are, you're probably stronger than somebody else. That means you have something to give into the life of somebody else. This is fascinating to me because it's just simply the, the basic commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, that is simply profound, isn't it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Some of you know, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated with the whole Mount Everest thing. You know, anybody else fascinated with the whole idea of, like, Mount Everest? I would never do it myself. I couldn't afford it. As it turns out, it costs about $40,000. Average. $40,000 to make a bid at climbing Everest, depending on who you use as your God and all that. So here you are. Picture the picture. The picture. You've, you've spent $40,000 to get yourself to Mount Everest. The weather's just right. There's 200 other people. It turns out that, that now climbing Everest has become more and more popular. More tourists are going and, and climbing, you know, from China and Japan and Europe and all that. So more and more people are climbing Everest now. So on, one, on any given day, you could have 200 people on that single rope line going 10 kilometers from this camp to the summit. And that creates... That creates log jams, that creates traffic jams. It didn't, you don't think about that, do you? It creates traffic jams on the way to the summit at Everest, and people are using oxygen, and oxygen runs out. So roughly six to eight people every season die at the summit, or, or going to the summit, or coming down from the summit of Mount Everest. Well, that's great, Steve, but what does all this have to do with Romans 15? I'm glad you asked. See, the article is called Mount Everest, the ethical dilemma facing climbers. You see, because not all climbers are as strong as other climbers. On your way up this rope to the summit of Everest, it turns out you may have to walk past dead bodies strung and ha ha hitched into that, that rope. Not only that, but you may have to walk past people that are in the process of dying while you are on that rope. And this is the ethical dilemma the article says, the sheer numbers of people climbing Everest now more reached the summit on a single day in 2010 than in the 30 years after the first 1953 ascent. It means 70 deaths have occurred since 2000, including 10 this year. This is from 2012. One uh, woman, a young girl, and her father were making a bid at the summit. Leanna Shuttleworth, age 19, and her father Mark headed for the 29,035-foot summit on May 19th. And 20th, up to 200 others had the same idea. Six of them lost their lives on that day. There were quite a few bodies attached to the fixed lines, and we had to walk around them, Shuttleworth said later. There were also a couple who were still alive, and she describes coming across one man who she assumed had perished. As we passed, he raised his arm and looked at us, she said. He didn't know anyone was there. He was almost dead. He was dead when we came back down. The debate around ethics on Everest has raged since 2006 when an estimated 40 climbers passed a dying British mountaineer named David Sharp without stopping. A week later, a U.S. climber, Don Mazur, and his team gave up their own summit bid 
to coordinate the rescue of an abandoned Australian named Lincoln Hall. He survived. On the weekend, the shuttle wars reached the summit. An Israeli climber, listen to this, Nadav Ben Yehuda, carried a Turkish-born American climber, Aidan Ermak, to safety on his back for eight hours. A couple of climbers of, of mountain leaders said, can it ever be right, in the words of Chris and Simon Holloway, for climbers to carry on to the summit while there are living people dying behind them? Interesting ethical dilemma. You've paid all this money. You may have one shot at it. The summit is, is right there, and you see someone who's suffering, who's weak, and who's perishing. And now you have a choice to make. Do I continue on to the summit? This may be my only shot ever. Or do I give up that need to please myself and to reach my summit so that I can help this person who's in need? You see, a lot of people come to Christianity and their whole goal is to summit the heights of spiritual, spirituality. It was my prayer time and my time of worship and my experience. And I'm living just so I can have this closeness to God and, I, and feel this certain thing and, and miss the whole point. You'll never be closer to God than when you are laying down your life for a friend, for a brother or sister. And that's exactly what Paul says here. He's given us the principle and now he gives us the proof in verse 3. He says, for even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the approaches of those who reproached, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And he quotes Psalm 69. Because you want an example of this, let me, let me give you a church. Let me show you where we get this principle. This principle crum, comes from Christ himself. You see, Christ, it's ridiculous to think about Christ pleasing himself. I mean, if there was ever someone who was strong in their faith, it would be Jesus. Am I, are you with me in that? Can we agree on that? There's no one stronger than Christ. And yet there was no one Le less, let me see if I get this right, no one more selfless than Christ. Isaiah 53, I, I could, my mind went right to Isaiah 53. Some of you know this. Surely he has borne, he bore our griefs, and he carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes, we are healed. The Lord laid on him the iniquity, the twistedness of us all. And that's the example that is set for us. And we say, and that for them it was food. It was, oh, I want to eat this juicy steak even though it's not kosher. And Paul's like, are you kidding? Really? Like all that Christ has done for you? And you say, oh, I can't live without the steak. I can't go without that glass of wine. For me... I mentioned, I can't do without, it was the plane ride on the way home from Bonaire. We're getting ready to take off, and there, the stewardess comes on and announces that there will be no peanuts on our flight. I said, no peanuts? That's blasphemy. This is an airline flight. There's got to be peanuts. Well, it turns out someone on the flight had a pretty bad peanut allergy. And so not only were they not going to serve peanuts to anybody, they encouraged us not to even engage in any peanut consumption of our own. Those of us that had brought peanuts inadvertently with us on the plane. Or peanut butter or any other peanut product. So it would be easy to say, well, wait a second. I paid money for this flight and I want to eat peanuts. I don't care what it costs anybody else. I'm eating peanuts. And how wrong would that be? But you see, we have that attitude sometimes. We fall in because of the world we live in, because of the culture we're surrounded by, we so easily fall into that, even in church. Well, I have the right to. Well, you might. But we, you don't exist by yourself in this community. There's other people to think about. So the responsibility, if you're strong, is to say, you know what? I need to look out. This is what Paul said going back to verse 2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good. For his good. Not, because maybe you read that and said, well, I thought people pleasing was wrong in the Bible. And I would say, 
amen, people pleasing is wrong because you'll never please people for their validation or for their approval. But this is not talking about people pleasing for their approval, but for their good, for what will do them good, not do you good. See, sometimes it might cost you pain or suffering like it did Christ when you deal with and bear with other people and their iniquities. Look, Paul didn't say, can we just agree? Paul didn't say, you know what? This is never going to work out with you guys. Let's just start two churches. We'll have the Jewish church over here, and we'll have the Gentile church over Over here we got the Messianic congregation, and over here we have the, the pagan Gentile congregation. Let's just do that. Then we won't have to worry about any of this getting along stuff. You see, that's not an option. That is not an option. The option is that we come together by compromise, by yielding, by sensitivity to one another and where we are, recognizing we're at different places in our lives and different places with the Lord. That's what Christ demonstrated, as is written in Psalm 69, a messianic, uh, Paul quotes that in terms of Jesus, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Think about what Christ went through when he was carrying your cross. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. Paul says that wasn't just for the Old Testament. That was for us. That were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. That we, through the patience and comfort of what? Of the Scriptures. Paul is saying to them and to me and to you that we are meant to read the Bible and understand what was happening in different people's lives at different times. And from that, derive for ourselves for now patience or endurance. Hey, if Christ went through that, I can go through it. And you look through the Bible and you read. I, I just, we're getting ready to start the book of Ruth here on Wednesday nights in a couple of Wednesdays. And you think about Ruth and Naomi and, and how Ruth just gave up. Her right to go get remarried and go on, start her own life after her husband died. And she says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you, Naomi. I'm going to follow you. So we see these all through the scriptures. Whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. I'll tell you, when I see people getting more selfish and acting more, you know, in terms of their own needs... I, you can almost always bet, if I ask you, have you been in the Word? Have you been in the Bible? You will say no. That is almost always a direct correlation between a lack of personal devotion in their life and a growing selfishness. Because people who are in the Word regularly are just affected by the selfless nature of the Word of God. So, we... For whatever things were written before, for our learning, that we, through the patience, the endurance, and the encouragement of the scriptures, might have hope. We come, we say, how is it ever going to work, God? How is this ever going to work? When we read the Bible, we go, you know what? I'm thinking about heaven, and when it, there's heaven, there's not going to be like, there's the story about this guy who dies and he goes to heaven, and he's getting this tour of heaven. Now, you know jokes are not theologically accurate, right? So he's getting his tour of heaven and comes by room number one and looks in and there's a bunch of people in there. Says, oh, and the, the, the angel guiding his tour says, okay, well, that's, that's where the Baptists are. And then they go along another room. Oh, yeah, there's, there's where the, the Methodists are there in that room. And, and then over here, that's where the Catholics are. And then now the angel says to the guy, now when we go by this next room, you got to be really quiet. So we tiptoe by the room. They tiptoe by the room. And if they get past the room, the guy says, well, why do we have to tiptoe and be so quiet? He says, well, that room, that's where all the Calvary Chapel people are, and they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> See, I have to turn it back on us, because if I said Methodist or Baptist, I'd get emails and get in trouble. But you get the idea, right? In heaven, it's going to be all nations, all tongues, all tribes, not just people like you. And we're all going to have to work it out there. So we read this in the Bible, that, that this is what's coming, and we have hope. Watch, because this little simple lesson based on a menu and a calendar, based on what day to worship and what food we can eat, has huge implications. Watch where Paul goes with this. He says, now, now he offers his prayer. Now, may the God of patience and comfort, 
Let me, let me stop right there for a second. When people look at you, when people look at your life, they say, wow, he's got a God of patience and comfort. Because the strong, sometimes people, we get impatient with other people, right? This is what we prayed about. We, we have, people look at our lives and might say, well, he serves a God of impatience. I don't want to be seen that way. The God, now may the God of patience and comfort, he's the source. You can't do this on your own. You need the God of patience and comfort or, or encouragement for people that are impatient and discouraged in church. May he grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this goes way beyond their little opinions and traditions in the church right there. This has huge implications for everybody, for the world. You see, the world is busy splintering. And when we splinter, God is not glorified. When we let traditions and, and opinions divide us, God is not glorified. We get to show the world a picture of what life under the kingdom of God is like. Sometimes you look at the church and you think it looks more like the animal kingdom. Where the, the, the strong eat the weak. And pray on the weak. We're not the animal kingdom. We're the heavenly kingdom. And the God is never more glorified than when he brings together people from radically different backgrounds and radically different cultures, brings them together into one church. Jew. You couldn't be farther apart than Jew and Gentile. They hated each other. You think black and white racist uh, problems in America were t are tough? You ain't seen nothing until you saw Jew and Gentile. The Jews wouldn't even go. If you touched a Gentile person, you were considered unclean. You didn't even touch someone who was a Gentile as a Jew, as a, as a traditionalist Jew, Pharisee. You didn't even touch someone, let alone eat in their house or eat, break bread with them. Remember, the Jews suffered from tremendous persecution throughout history from the Gentiles. They were enslaved under Egyptian rule. They were conquered by the Assyrians. They were enslaved by the Babylonians and dragged off, you know, conquered and their cities burned and Romans, all Gentiles. Remember, there's Jews and there's the Gentiles, which are the rest of the world. That's what Gentile means, everybody else. So the Jews hated everybody else because everybody else had hated them, anti-Semitism. And so when God brings these people together, when God brings us together from all kinds of backgrounds, it glorifies God. When we work through our traditions and opinions and differences, when we're sensitive to each other, when we bear with one another in love, the world looks on and goes, man, how are they doing that? How is that working? Because the world can pull it off on a superficial level, but not with real relationship. You really want to do something godly you really want to be strong how can i how can i do this how can i please my neighbor for his good how can i lead do something that leads to his his building up his progress it starts with the decision to have a relationship with that person the very person you want to run away from may be the person you need to develop a relationship with if you're so strong and they're so weak why don't you get to know them why don't you come on alongside of them and show them in practical ways, the, what your strength has done for you, bringing joy and peace into your life. I told you, it ain't the parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that do understand. He says, therefore, after he prays that, with, that, with, that they with one mind and one mouth would glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, verse 7, therefore, receive one another. Welcome one another. Take one another into relationship is what that means. Receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. When you got saved, we're going to celebrate communion next Wednesday night. When you come to that table, God is glorified because there's a whole lot of people that didn't want you around their table. There's a whole lot of places that would not accept you. 
And when God says, if nobody else wants you, I'll take you. I'll take you. You can come be part of my family. doesn't matter what the, the world may have rejected you. Or you may have been working so hard to be accepted by the world and you're tired of that game. God says, you don't have to change yourself to come to me. You come just as you are. That's how God received us, right? He received us because we came because we knew we needed him. And when people come in those front doors, you don't know where they're coming from. And they're, they're out on the front porch smoking a cigarette, put it out before they come to church. You might, oh, can you believe they're smoking it, coming to church? Knock that off. We want them to be here, right? God's accepted them. Let God deal with their smoking or whatever. God deal with those things. They need the Lord. And when people come to Christ that way, and we, you know, they can come to Christ, Christ receives them, the problem is the church. Just as Christ also received us, where were you when God received you? Did you have it all together? Were you really strong? I mean, I know I got saved, and I made a huge amount of mistakes, and I still sinned a lot because I didn't know any better. I didn't know the Word of God. I was growing, and I was still engaged in some sin, but my heart was sensitive. And when I was confronted by someone who was stronger than me about a sin in my life, it broke my heart. And I wanted to do right for God. I wanted to not please people for their validation. But I wanted to please God. Just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles, the world, might glorify God for his mercy as it is written for this reason, I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing your name. So he quotes Psalm 18. He's going to give us just pound us with scripture after scripture. Pound them with scripture after scripture. Why? Because he's speaking to the Jews about accepting the Gentiles. That when Paul says, look, we're going to serve the Lord as one big happy family all over the world. Jew, Gentile, Russian, Chinese, from Ecuador, from Venezuela, whatever other place you're from when we do that as one group when God brings us all together all we're doing all Jesus was doing was fulfilling the very promises that God made to who well look right there to the fathers and he mentions circumcision right when we talk about the fathers we talk about Abraham Isaac Jacob the fathers of Israel and it was when he says that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision so, of course, we know that circumcision was part of uh, the promise. It was a sign of the promise that God had made to Abraham. What was the promise that God made to Abraham? Well, I marked it. This is in conjunction with the passage in Genesis where, where Abraham is told to circumcise his, uh, his children. I'm, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, God says. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God talked to them, saying, As for me, God speaking, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Not one nation, the Jews, many nations. And then he goes on to talk about that some more, that God had made Abraham, even Genesis 12, a father of many nations. So Paul is saying, look, welcoming the Gentiles into, into relationship with God is fulfilling the promises that God initially made to Abraham in the first place. Because the Jews would have connected themselves tightly to Abraham. Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm or to guarantee the promises made to the fathers. What promises? That the gospel, that the good news, that salvation would go to the whole world. So he gives it to us from a number of places. Psalm 18 speaks of the Gentiles. Verse 10, and again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, not apart from, separate from his people, but with his people. That's from Deuteronomy 32. And again, verse 11 says, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Loud him, all you peoples. That's Psalm 117, about how the, all the world will praise the Lord. And again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall, receive, uh, ri shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope, or literally trust, so that... God will be this root of Jesse through the line of David, King David, shall reign even over the Gentiles. 
So do you see what argument Paul is building here? That, that the Gentiles, the world, and the Jews are all part of the same promises that God has made. And verse 13, he wraps it up and says, now. Now, that, now they're in shell shock from the truths that he's laid out to them about selfishness and their need to, uh, to forget about pleasing themselves and, and think about others. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. How? In believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that's a prayer, right? Now may the God of hope, he is a God of hope, and hope in the Bible is not uh, hope like hope in the world. Hope in the Bible is not, oh, I hope we can all get along. Hope in the Bible is a promise that will be fulfilled in time. We can count on it. It's guaranteed. So the promises of God are guaranteed. We just have to wait for them. So we hope, waiting until it actually happens. You know, we pray. We, Jesus taught us to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And again, in heaven, we're going to have all nations, all tribes, all tongues worshiping the Lord together. Don't, don't we want to pray for that on earth? Do we want to pray for that in Fluvanna County? That there doesn't have to be a black church and a white church? That we can all be one church? Yeah, there's differences of culture, but how do we accommodate those? These are battles I've had to fight as a pastor. These are battles we have to fight as a church. And the, the God that I read about in these pages is a God that brings people together. And that gives me hope. And, and then when you have that hope, he says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy. Anybody need that? Anybody need to fill, be filled with all joy today? Anybody need to be filled with all peace today? How's that going to happen? How are you gonna, well, I just want to show up for church and be filled with peace. I just want to show up for church and be filled with joy. How does he do it? How does God do it? He does it in believing. When you trust God and do what he says. So when, this is the thing, this is what, what Paul is saying, that the proof is in the pudding. When you live a selfless life, God is glorified and you are filled with peace and joy. The world tells you, if you just please yourself, you'll be filled with peace and joy. And has the world found that to be true? Say no. No. We are a mess. We are a selfish, toxic, American mess. And it's time to be truthful about that and say, you know what? What we've been doing isn't working. Maybe we should try something else. Let's give this selfless thing a try. And that should be truer nowhere else than in the church. And you watch. I dare you. I dare you to try it. I dare you to pray about selflessness in your life. And for God, that as you trust him with your selflessness, if you give your life away to help others, when's the last time you found someone who was weaker than you and stepped into their life, stepped into their mess and yuck? It's really inconvenient, but it will fill your life with not just inconvenience and struggle, but man, joy and peace. Because you know that you know that you know you're doing what God wants. You're like Christ in those moments. That you, and can, but, but Steve, I, don't ha I can't do that myself. Like I don't have the power to do that. That's why he says, in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Church, we can't do it by ourselves. That love, that kind of love, that kind of patience, that kind of endurance doesn't come from the human spirit. You know, it's, it's easier to climb Everest and summit than it is to say no to the summit and put a guy on your back for eight hours to save his life. It's easier to come to a prayer meeting or come to a Bible study than it is to show up at someone's house when their marriage is falling apart and cry with them. And pray with them. And just get into their lives. That's when we become what Christ has wanted us to become. When we're most Christ-like. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we close out today, you've just laid some challenging stuff on us, Lord. And I pray for us as a church to move beyond selfish worship to that selfless care and sensitivity to those around us. Lord, give us eyes to see the needs around us. 
Give us a heart that cares more for doing good and building others up than being built up ourselves. Your word is so powerful and so strong, and Lord, we need your spirit to do it. So we pray for your spirit, a fresh filling of your spirit to fall on this congregation today. That all of God's people who want that, who want to be filled with joy and peace, would just be open, Lord, to that. Open our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen, amen. Let's, as we stand.